June. I'm Alison Thayer, producer of our series, Let's Talk About Light and Health. June's been a pretty busy month with travel, so I'm going to take over for Randy and do the interview today. We have an interesting topic titled fee 5 fo fungicide light as a natural pesticide. Today's talk is sponsored by Acclaim Lighting. We really appreciate your sponsorship, and we couldn't put these events on without companies like you. Today, I'm joined with Dr. David Godori, a researcher at Plant Pathology and Plant Microbiology section at Cornell University. That's quite a mouthful. Do I have that right? You have it right. Our name was much simpler before. We were just a department of plant pathology, but like all things, it gets redescribed and reorganized periodically. How long have you been with the group at Cornell? Can you give us a little on your background and how you ended up with this group? I've been here forever. Uh, so I started at Cornell in November of 1985, uh, immediately out of graduate school, uh, received my PhD and master's degree at the University of New Hampshire, and uh, went from there to Cornell, and I've been here ever since. Will you give us a little bit of an understanding on um, you know, how big of a problem is plant disease in American agriculture? For certain people, it's the problem. Uh, you know, one of the reasons we're kind of an under the radar profession of controlling plant diseases, but when you have one that is out of control, it becomes uh, the problem. So there have been a number of uh, certainly highly publicized and, and well-known uh, epidemics of plant disease in the US. So for example, Dutch elm disease, chestnut blight, uh, there was a uh, corn leaf blight epidemic in the 1970s that destroyed uh, a significant part of the U.S. corn crop. So although these kinds of losses are rare, uh, these chronic losses occur every year and severe losses occur, occur sporadically, but catastrophically in small locations every year. So it's bad for somebody every year in some place. And what are the typical ways of controlling this? The kind of the bedrock of plant pathology would be the development of varieties that are resistant to disease. That's not always possible. There are, there are multiple diseases and putting all of those resistance genes together in something that is high yielding and appealing to a consumer is often uh, virtually impossible. So even varieties that have fairly broad resistance are remain susceptible to a few key pathogens. The other problem is that um, we are distributing pests uh, globally now. So we deal with a lot of exotic pests that weren't here five years ago. So varietal resistance is the bedrock of uh, plant disease management, but there are other means at our disposal. Uh, the use of uh, uh, chemical materials that can suppress various plant diseases and pests. Uh, there are quarantines that we can enforce to exclude pathogens. And then we can modify uh, the environment as well to favor the plant over a pathogen. So we have a variety of uh, tactics at our disposal, and we try to integrate those to produce the best outcome. Would you say that pesticides are used a lot in... Uh, trying to maintain uh, crops? In a way that we use medicine a lot uh, to keep uh, people healthy. So yes, we use them when they're necessary. We don't use them when they're not necessary. And we try to use other methods uh, to mitigate the need for, uh, for chemical controls. But yes, they are broadly used. Yeah, so when you say us, you mean kind of all the farmers across America and across the world? It varies from crop to crop. It varies from location to location. Some areas have relatively severe uh, epidemics of endemic diseases, diseases that are that are historically occur in that area. Others are, uh, I, I would say, less friendly to the major diseases, and and it's a better place to grow the crop without pesticides. So it's it's hard to come up with a general statement that covers all of those. We grow a lot of different crops in a lot of different places, and they have a lot of pathogens attacking them. So I know a lot of the work that you do has to do, um, you know, in some of the more recent stuff is, is using light um, instead or along with fungicides. Can you talk about this a little bit more? 
Well, that's a relatively new uh, tactic that we've employed. And so uh, it came out of uh, a long-term interest uh, with uh, of, of mine and some collaborators in looking at how uh, these microscopic uh, pathogens actually deal with light. Now, they, they have evolved over uh, very long periods of time. Pathogens have been attacking plants for well over 300 million years. So they've had a long time hanging around in the sunlight to figure out uh, how best to attack a plant. And, and over an evolutionary scale of time, they have developed to use light to direct their development. They use it to their advantage in, in many different ways on when they should discharge spores, at what time of day. They use light to turn things on and turn things off in trying to infect a plant. And so more recently, we've discovered how to use some of those evolved relationships against them. Is this something you do these studies in the lab and then implement them into the field? It's a little bit of both. Uh, so some things we anticipate would work and we try preliminary work in the laboratory to kind of work out the, the basic parameters for the field testing. Other things we find by accident in the field. For example, we were doing tests uh, on the suppression of powdery mildew on grapevines uh, in, the, in the vineyard. And we found out by accident that we were controlling a disease called sour rot. Now, Sour rot is a disease for which we don't have a lot of good controls. It's, it's a kind of a complex mess of fruit feeding insects, bacteria, and fungi that all kind of work together to rot grapes. Uh, when we used UV on the vines to suppress powdery mildew, we also noticed we were getting excellent suppression of sour rot. We had no reason to think that that would happen. It just happened. So when you say light, what does that mean? So are there specific wavelengths that you found work best? Well, plant pathogens, just like plants, respond to some key wavelengths in the visible spectrum, in particular, uh, red light and blue light. And this balance between red light and blue light is very important uh, in plant growth and also signaling in plant pathogens. But the newest area that we've been exploring actually has to do with outside the visible spectrum. There are a few organisms that can see ultraviolet light or see at the, at the higher end of the UV spectrum. Uh, but what we're using is germicidal UV, uh, sh very short wave UV. It's also called UVC. Uh, it's been around for, <laughs> for as long as light has been around, but we've been able to produce it with electric lighting uh, for at least 75 to 80 years. Uh, it looks like a, uh, a light that's produced by a common fluorescent tube, but it's actually called a low pressure discharge bulb or lamp. And it produces um, a very short wave UV, UVC, that's centered on a, a wavelength of about 254 nanometers. But why that's significant is that wavelength happens to be the peak absorbance for DNA. I, I could get into a more detailed explanation than that if you'd like. Yeah, that sounds interesting. I'd love to hear more. So UV is a part of natural sunlight. Um, UVC doesn't reach the Earth's surface. It's filtered out by the ozone layer. But there are slightly longer wavelengths of UV, UVB, uh, that's around 280 nanometers. That does reach the Earth's surface. And it interacts with the DNA of any living organism. If you're a big multicellular organism, like a person or a plant, uh, you can shield yourself with skin, uh, with clothing, with fur, uh, with, in the case of plants, with a waxy cuticle that, uh, that UV can't penetrate. Because if it did penetrate and it contacted your UV, it does the same thing to everybody's DNA and everybody's got DNA, including plants. It causes binding between uh, some of the base pairs in DNA, and it glues it together. And that, uh, that binding of the base pairs is lethal if it's not corrected within about four hours. Now, a multicellular organism can sustain some damage and survive. But if you have one cell, if you're a single-celled organism, and UV messes up your DNA, uh, and it's not fixed, you're dead within four hours. Now, 
as, as I said, these things have evolved in natural sunlight over hundreds of millions of years. So they have evolved to fix this kind of damage as fast as it occurs. And that, that's a really interesting part of the story. That fixing requires blue light. So they have an enzyme called a photolyase that as fast as UV can stick this DNA together to make just junk. Uh, this photolyase enzyme comes along and, and repairs that damage and happens almost instantaneously. But that reaction requires blue light. Now that fact is the key to using UV successfully to kill a plant pathogen without harming the plant. Because if you apply the UV at night, there's no blue light to fix the damage. And so you can use a dose of UV that damages the pathogen's DNA and results in its death, but that's a dose that's far below anything that would damage the plant. And that's the advance that has occurred in using this technology uh, in over the last 10 years. Well, that is really fascinating. So you mentioned the timing of it, which is nighttime. Is there a certain duration or um, you know, a way that, that farmers use this in application? Well, like anything else, the poison is in the dose. And so you have to use an appropriate amount of UV that would kill the pathogen without harming the plant. And that's worked out in, a, in laboratory experiments. You, you try different doses, uh, apply them over different times, at uh, different intervals, and eventually you arrive at a prescription that will control uh, a number of different pathogens uh, and do so efficiently and effectively. When we talked about giving this dose of light at night, what is the type of apparatus that you use for that? Well, you want to um, have, a, have a device that is usable in the current agricultural system. So if you're looking for something that's gonna be pulled by a tractor, you want it to be able to move at a speed that is common for a tractor drawn implement. Uh, farmers can't operate a tractor over large acreages at a 10th of a mile per hour. That's just not going to work for them. It's not gonna fit their, their production system. So typical tractor speeds for uh, tractor drawn implements are closer to five miles per hour or more. So you need to design an array that can move at that speed. It can apply an effective dose of UV uh, that can travel at five miles per hour and still deliver that dose effectively. So it has to be a rather intense array. Uh, that, that really, uh, everything else is designed around that, the need for speed. And so, although we have a number of different devices, uh, lamp types that could produce uh, UVC, the device that works the best and is practical are these low pressure discharge lamps that have been around for, for decades. These are very widely used in hospital operating rooms in in other areas in water purification, air purification, food processing, and so on. They're relatively low cost. They're extremely powerful. They, you uh, get a lot of UV out of them for every watt of energy that you put in. And so that makes them a good technology uh, for a for a farm uh, a farm friendly and tractor drawn implement, and that's what we designed these arrays around. Designing the array to do the job properly is is the key. Uh, it it doesn't you can't just stick a light bulb on a piece of equipment and drive it around. It needs to be designed to penetrate a, a relatively complex canopy many layers, uh, upper and lower surfaces in all kinds of orientations. Uh, and it can be quite large depending on, on the crop. Anything from a strawberry plant, which looks pretty simple, but isn't, to the canopy of an apple tree or a grapevine. So designing that array to be able to bounce enough light around to reach all of those surfaces is, is a bit of an engineering challenge. Uh, but but a solvable problem uh, and one that we've we've solved. So you make different apparatuses based on the basically the sizing of of each of the crops. You have different ones. You apply the same principles to the design of the arrays. Uh, the one that works the best for us it could probably best be described as hemi cylindrical. So think of an arch uh, that could be stretched or. Uh, 
uh, widened or increased in height in any any possible direction uh, to envelop the canopy. Uh, we use multiple lamps, and those are backed by uh, a number of polished reflectors. Uh, so what you end up with are a large number of reflectance angles. And so the, the intensity of the uh, UV energy reaching the plant's surface is almost independent of its distance to the nearest lamp. And that's important. You want a, you want a uniform dose irrespective of the orientation of the surface that you're aiming at. We also have reflective curtains at the front and back of that hemicylinder that send the light in at very shallow angles as the unit approaches the plant and as it's leaving the plant. So I guess the, the, the design of the array makes it awfully hard for a pathogen to hide from the energy. And so we cover most of the surfaces as this array moves over a plant. And that, that's, a, that's an important factor in designing an apparatus that's both safe uh, and effective. So these apparatuses are as effective or are they more effective than just using pesticides? Depends on the pest and depends on the crop. I mean, UV is not a magic bullet. It doesn't control everything. It's really good against powdery mildews because they're on the surface of the plant. That makes them an easy target. It's also great for um, mites that feed on plants because they tend to lay their eggs in an exposed location. And it's the egg stage of mites that's very sensitive to UV. So we can kill off a large uh, portion of the population of a mite uh, outbreak with UV. But there are some surprisingly, uh, would, I guess, pathogens that would seem to be a more difficult target, but are nonetheless controlled. For example, uh, we're working on a beet pathogen called Cercospora. The name's not important. What is important is that unlike a powdery mildew, this thing is really darkly pigmented. Now, melanin is a structural compound that's known to provide a defense against UV. It's a dark compound that absorbs UV, and it's a shielding against damage to the DNA. The Cercospora spore has a lot of pigment, and you would think that that would offer some defense. And it does. It takes a higher dose of UV to kill Cercospora on a beet plant than it does to kill a powdery mildew on any other crop, about four times the dose. But four times the dose is still sufficient to kill Cercospora, and that's a dose that's below uh, the level that would harm uh, the beets. It certainly doesn't cause as much harm as Cercospora does if it's not controlled. So uh, again, uh, this would appear to be something that might rule out UV as a means of control, but it's, 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 not, a, it's not the limitation that we thought it would be uh, before going into this. So the more tests we do, uh, the more we learn about uh, the diversity of plant pathogens that we can actually control with this technology. We've been talking about this supplemental electric lighting that you can use now that we have that advanced technology. But I know you also recently did a study on the UV transmittance of plastics. Will you tell us more about this publication? Sure. So virtually all plastics that are used in horticulture uh, block almost all UV. So they're polyethylene or polycarbonate materials or uh, plate glass that is used in greenhouses. That blocks all UV. Now, Greenhouse and high tunnel environments, these plastic tunnels, are known to be extremely favorable for the development of a disease called powdery mildew. The conventional wisdom has always been that powdery mildews are worse in these high tunnels and glass houses because of humidity and temperature uh, that is favorable inside the structure, less favorable outside. And that's... That's been the way we've approached this problem for, for decades. More recently, the research we've done has shown that a, a substantial part, if not most of the exacerbation of these powdery mildews inside of uh, glass houses and high tunnels is actually due to filtering out the UV content of natural sunlight. And so if you find a material that will actually transmit natural solar UV, you can return the greenhouse to something closer to the field environment. Across a broad range of relative humidity and temperature, uh, 
making you know powdery mildew is less of a problem inside of a greenhouse. The material that works the best that we've used is what's called a fluorocarbon plastic. Uh, it's similar to Teflon, uh, but very tough, very clear, and it transmits uh, virtually 100% of natural solar UV. And that alone uh, provides significant suppression of powdery mildews uh, across many different crops. Uh, that's something that you don't think about, really. Well, these materials have been around for a long time, but they've been exploited mostly for their structural properties. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, there are uh, plastic greenhouses uh, along the coast of Japan in the typhoon areas where they're, you know, they're used to experiencing 100 mile an hour winds every few years that would uh, otherwise destroy these, uh, these structures. These structures have been there for 30 years with these fluorocarbon plastic coverings without changing the plastic, and they withstood, uh, I mean, several episodes of hurricane force winds. So that's the reason people have been exploiting these fluorocarbon plastics. They're expensive, but they're more or less permanent uh, when you build a structure out of them. It's only more recently that we've discovered the benefits of using fluorocarbon plastics as a material that would allow penetration of natural solar UV. So we have what we talked about today, two different options. So we have the tractor pulling apparatus as well as the UV transmittance plastics. So are these treatments cost effective? They are. Uh, it, you uh, have to spread those costs over sufficient acreage to recover uh, the cost of construction, but some of the designs that uh, we've come up with in collaboration with the Light and Health Center, uh, you could build these for somewhere between five and $10,000. That's relatively low cost for uh, a tractor-drawn implement for uh, disease management. For example, uh, a sprayer uh, a hydraulic sprayer of some kind that was run off the PTO of a tractor would be many times that cost, uh, up fifty to one hundred thousand dollars to do the same job. So, what do you see the future of light treatments in terms of controlling plant diseases? Well, I think we're just scratching the surface at this point. Uh, we're we're certainly focusing on uh, the uses of UV at, at present, uh, but we've barely scratched the surface on what we could do with other parts of the spectrum or in other ways that we might use UV to perhaps boost plant immunity uh, to diseases. Uh, there are various things we could do with visible light. We, we know that fungi are sensing uh, these wavelengths and they're using them to direct their development. So the, the open question is, how can we use that against them? So I, I think that's the future. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. It's very interesting and we'll now open the floor for questions. Hey everybody, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Godori, thank you. And we would like to thank our sponsor, Acclaim Lighting. The floor is now open and please do use the Q&A button to submit your questions. We will then unmute your mic and you can verbally ask the question or if you want to Main anonymous, you can just submit your question and we will read it. Here. Um, you mentioned that the peak absorbance for DNA uh, was 254, but looking at the germicidal effectiveness or the response curve from the IES, it peaks at 265. Can you explain this a little bit more? Certainly. Uh, the absorbance and lethality to any particular organism are often slightly different. Uh, and that can have to do with the ability of the longer UV wavelengths to penetrate uh, substances more efficiently. Uh, shorter wavelengths are easier to block, uh, in particular by UV resistant materials like waxes or glasses or plastics. And so when you test them on a biological organism, you often do see a slightly enhanced efficacy at a longer wavelength. In fact, on several organisms, we find uh, that wavelengths up around 283 nanometers are actually uh, the most biologically active, despite the fact that the peak absorbance of DNA, which is actually what's being damaged, is, is somewhat lower. Sure. Dr. Gloria, I just found your talk fascinating. And I want to go back to the um, fluorocarbon plastics. Glass would be better 
but the fluorocarbon plastic is stronger. Is that correct? Fluorocarbon plastics are amazingly tough materials. If you've ever worked with them, they're, they're very tear resistant. Uh, they're much stronger than glass, uh, you know, thickness for thickness. If you were to make a, a fluorocarbon plastic greenhouse of the thickness that you would use for glass, it would, it would be uh, <laughs> probably bomb proof. Okay. Uh, so these materials that are used on uh, plastic houses uh, that I mentioned uh, that are used on the coast of Japan and the typhoon areas, uh, these are uh, just a few mils thick and they've withstood hurricane force winds for over 25 years at this point. And no yellowing, no yellowing. No, they don't yellow. Okay, thank you, understood. Yeah, uh, the, the company that makes, that's probably the largest maker of them for the horticultural industry is a shy glass corporation, ASC. Uh, and you can visit their website and look at their uh, materials. The one that we used for our research was called F Clean Clear. So just F hyphen clean clear. Uh, okay. That's a fluorocarbon plastic, similar to Teflon. And, and I've got one more question, if I may. You mentioned about, I think I, I heard you say, new pests that we didn't have five years ago. What does that mean? It means uh, a pest that's usually been imported uh, to North America from abroad. So think of the emerald ash borer, uh, you know, virtually all of the pandemics that have swept across the country, Dutch elm disease, chestnut blight, these things changed the landscape of North America by wiping out uh, species that were once the dominant uh, tree species or landscape trees in either our cities or in the Eastern forests. So these are uh, exotic pests. When they arrive in a new country, they're, they're native pests when they're here, Sure. I mean, our gift to the European grape industry were two diseases called downy mildew and powdery mildew that virtually destroyed the European grape industry in the 1800s. So we, we do have a vibrant trade in, in pests. Uh, it's all been globalized at this point. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, can the low pressure discharge lamps be exterior rated for permanent installation in, say, orchards or even vineyards? I think so. If they were properly shielded from direct impact uh, and the fixtures that they were in were able to survive uh, high humidity and perhaps some surface moisture. So it would take a weatherproof fixture, which those are available, and they might need to be cleaned periodically because they're quite attractive to insects. And so these suicidal flies come in in the middle of the night and, and moths and, and get under these UV lamps, much to their detriment. Yes, that's that's pretty unfortunate. But they're they're certainly durable enough for fixed installations, and and in fact, they're used in fixed installations in greenhouses. In in probably five years of trials at this point, up until last week, we had not broken a single lamp in field applications, so that they're quite durable. I want to circle back to um, can we talk about the the advantages and disadvantages of the tractor pulled apparatuses versus the autonomous robots you were mentioning? Mm -hmm. Sure. The advantage of the tractor drawn implement is that it's less expensive and it's immediately adaptable uh, to present uh, farming operations with minimal tr training. So a farmer who has uh, some fabrication experience or has access to a local fabricator, a welder perhaps, uh, can construct one of these relatively quickly and, and cheaply uh, for their operation. The advantage of the autonomous robot is it's autonomous. <laughs> it's down for, I guess its drawback is that it's quite expensive and it's, it's a piece of technology that most people would require some training uh, to operate or they would have to rent the robot as a service. Would, these are business plans that are being worked out now with the various manufacturers and service providers. So there, there are companies that produce equipment, there are companies that produce robots, and there are companies that produce and sell a service involving autonomous robots. Uh, Dr. Godori, you discussed uh, mainly low discharge lamps 
the uh, legacy technology that's been around for, for several decades. Have you looked at LEDs and do LEDs, uh, UV LEDs have enough energy for this type of application? Well, I've looked at them, but it's it's outside my area of expertise. But the people I work with at Mount Sinai uh, Light and Health Center, uh, they're the experts. And their take on it is that presently they're underpowered for, for agricultural applications, but they're getting better every year. And so I think it's a matter of time before LEDs are able to uh, provide a, a substitute for these low pressure discharge lamps, whether they will do so in a way that's cost effective is, is, is an open question. But there are special applications for something like an LED uh, that makes them uh, very attractive. For example, they're small and uh, they are very, uh, easy to direct. So if you were to think of something like uh, a robotic hand that was going to pick a fruit, it could be fitted with LEDs and deliver that energy to a, a perhaps very difficult to reach target instantaneously as the fruit was being harvested. So for special applications, the UV technology uh, delivered through uh, LEDs, uh, it's in the future, but perhaps not in the distant future. That's fascinating to think about a glove when you're picking the, the apple or the peach or the orange. That really is. We, we also talked about the, kind of the, the difference between these applications on kind of smaller local farms versus you know, larger farms that, that have a lot of crops. Do you have any other, um, you know, any other points you want to make um, about that? Well, a lot of it's just economies of scale. And, and so uh, larger operations can spread the fixed costs of a technology over larger acreage. Uh, there are limits. Uh, I mean, the for example, a UV robot is relatively expensive compared to a tractor drawn unit. But if you spread that cost over a lot of acreage, uh, then uh, it, can, it can be actually more economical. Uh, but the capital costs of buying a dozen such robots for a large operation and running them seven days a week, uh, now you're getting into maintenance of a fleet of robots. And you, you do, uh, at that point, you need probably some in-house uh, uh, tech experts and also repair people because these things, uh, like any piece of equipment, will wear out. And so the service providers who actually take on that responsibility might be a, an, another option. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, you can design an, a piece of equipment that fits the, the, the capital available uh, for a, a broad range of applications. So uh, we can build these things. Uh, I think one of the illustrations you showed was actually a push cart unit uh, where, uh, where a graduate student is the power. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't even require a tractor. Uh, there are others that are simple, tractor-drawn, but one-row units. There are multiple-row units and some very large tractor-drawn units that can treat very large acreages. For example, uh, there's one that we've uh, designed for use in a strawberry nursery that covers uh, a 15-foot-wide swath of beds of strawberry nursery plants. And that thing can move at up to about seven miles per hour. So it can treat uh, considerable acreage in a single evening. Do you foresee pathogens evolving to be resistant to UVC wavelengths? I do not. Uh, this technology has been in use now for, for many decades in a variety of situations. Uh, and there are no reports of UV uh, immune microbes. Uh, you might select towards uh, something that requires a slightly higher dose. Uh, but resistance to this kind of an environmental insult is uh, it, difficult to conceive. It would require multiple genetic changes uh, and a survival of, uh, I guess, a, um, a type of injury that is rather catastrophic for a living cell. Uh, it's a bit like having a piano dropped on you. It's gonna be difficult to develop resistance to that it's gonna have a powerful fitness cost uh, if you have to say, develop a shell that could uh, resist that kind of mechanical force. 
So this is this is a type of injury uh, that is is very difficult to conceive of an organism surviving. The evidence for that is that it hasn't happened in 70 years of application across uh, hospital uses, water purification, uh, and a sterilization of surfaces. Okay, well, Dr. Godori, let, let's wrap up here, but thank you so much uh, for this conversation. I found it fascinating. Uh, this uh, segment will be available on YouTube later this week, and please do join us for our next Light and Health series, and that will be Exposomics with Dr. Robert Wright on 25 July at noon Eastern. Thank you all.